Well, today we're interviewing uh, Mary O'Donnell, and I'm going to say welcome to the O State uh, Stories uh, Interview Project. And it's April 30th, uh, 2010. And today we're interviewing Mary O'Donnell, and she is a cataloger here at the OSU Library. And she's retiring, and we're thankful that you're here to uh, visit with us. And my name is Janet Arberg. And so let's uh, just kind of start off with some uh, basic questions. Um, Mary, can you tell us a little bit about where you grew up at? Uh, I grew up in a very small town in Iowa called Slater. Um, it has never been much more than 8,000 people. I think it's probably even less than that now. So it was uh, very quiet. Everybody knew everybody. Everybody was related to everybody. And uh, uh, it was just uh, what you would expect of a small town uh, back in the 50s and 60s especially. The, everything that was kind of cliched about small towns was typical of that. <laughs> Uh, when well, you talked a little bit about what it was like, um, can you tell us a little bit about your family and the times that when you grew up? What was the era and uh, what, what did your folks do? Uh, my dad was a carpenter. Uh, he had been in the Army Air Force in the Second World War and had really wanted to be a pilot, but then he met my mother and they got married not long after that. So he went ahead and got a, uh, some GI courses at uh, Iowa State and became a carpenter. And my mom um, was a homemaker for most of her life. And then later on, when my dad got Parkinson's disease, she went ahead and became a postal clerk and was a postal clerk for about 15, 20 years. So, so. Well, I know you come from a large family. Can you tell us how large and how many yes. brothers and sisters you have? I have five sisters and eight brothers. <laughs> So we had our own baseball teams, football teams, you name it, we had it. <laughs> well, what was that like growing up in a family? And where were you in the in the family? I setting? am the second one. So I like to tell people that I've been through all the pangs of parenthood, except actually having the baby. <laughs> so, uh, each of us, as we got older, the older kids always adopted at least one of the younger children to take care of, and that kind of helped things out. But we came along fairly close together, so my... I don't know how my mom did it the first 10 years, but by by the time we were 9 or 10, we were able to help take out, uh, take care of the little kids. We had chores from the very beginning. Okay. So, um, what, what was your school like when there? Did you attend school in Slater? Yeah. Uh, the grade school in Slater uh, was, I think, built back in the 20s, and it was a big brick building. They added on a gym later on. And uh, we basically had just one class of each grade because it wasn't that big. Uh, later on, when I was in sixth grade, they decided to consolidate with uh, three other towns and build a high school in uh, Huxley, which is about seven miles away. So by the time I got to junior high, we actually went over to Huxley, and that kind of enlarged the circle of people that we knew. Even then, it wasn't that big. Uh, school, there were 65, no, 83 people in my graduating class, which seemed like a fairly large class to us, but it was not. <laughs> so where did you attend college at then? Uh, undergraduate college, I went to University of Northern Iowa, and I got my degree in uh, teaching art education, uh, grade school, and uh, I liked you and I very much. It was a small college, very pretty, and uh, I lived in the dorm, and that was a lot of fun, except some of my roommates were rather strange. <laughs> but I had a good time with that. So and, where did you get your uh, library degree then? Uh, before I got my library degree, I actually went back to University of Iowa and got a degree, a master's degree in art history. And I actually taught at Iowa Wesleyan College for four years and worked in the library there as well and I decided I liked the library better than I liked teaching the art history and so then I went to University of Iowa in 79 and got my library degree and then I came here in 1980 and I've been here ever since. Okay. Well, when and why did you decide to become a cataloger? 
Uh, there again, it was as we were taking the classes. I've discovered that I like doing the cataloging better than I like the other stuff that we did, the reserve and the the uh, reference and all the other things. And I just liked the organizing of things and uh, looking things up. I think by, by cataloging a lot of different books, you actually learn an awful lot about different topics because you have to understand what the topics are in order to assign the call numbers and the subject headings. And I just like that. <laughs> Some of my classmates called me a uh, misanthrope <laughs> because, <laughs> because catalogers just become catalogers because they can stay back there and not interact with people. So that was that was, so I said, okay, that's what I'll do. Okay. Um, so there wasn't really an, a person that influenced you the most? Yes, actually there was. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Jean Osborne taught the cataloging class, and she was a very enthusiastic person, and she made it a lot of fun as well. Well, some of them didn't think it was fun, but I thought it was hilarious, and uh, I just really enjoyed her her demeanor and her class and there again she was one of these and I think a cataloger has to be this is interested in a lot of things and she was always finding different things for us to catalog or to practice on in such a variety of topics and she was able to tell us something about each one of them that's interesting okay is she still alive do you know uh, as far as I know she's not she was in her 70s at the time and that was 20 years ago, no, 30, almost 30 years ago. Okay. So I don't think she is alive anymore. Okay. So when did you start at the OSU library? 1980, okay. and uh, September 1st, which happened to be Labor Day. So, <laughs> so was the OSU job your first uh, library professional job? Yes, okay. it was. Oh. I did work at Iowa Wesleyan as a paraprofessional in the catalog department, which is another reason I decided to like cataloging. And I also worked in the uh, audiovisual department and in the circulation department. Uh, what factors uh, interest you in taking the position here at OSU? Uh, well, this is kind of incidental, but one of the things was my brother was moving to Bartlesville. Mm -hmm. So there was going to be family close hand. But it was just, it sounded like the kind of thing I wanted to do. And the library is large, but not so large that it would be difficult to do things. And uh, I worked um, as a student at the University of Iowa, one of the university libraries, because uh, they have uh, the, the main library, and then they have several branches. And people get so specialized, they only catalog one thing, which is, I didn't really want to do that. Whereas here, you got to catalog a variety of things. Some of them you didn't particularly want to catalog, but there were a lot that, and that was how, I think that's one reason why catalogers are the best Trivial Pursuit players, because they pick up this information as they go along. And that was one of the things that appealed to me. So. Um, who was, uh, was uh, how many years have you devoted to the library? Uh, if I were to stay to September 1st, it would be 30 years complete. Okay. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit what the camp was like back then? Okay. Uh, I don't think it was that much difference. Uh, the Noble Center wasn't built yet, so there was a big parking lot. Uh, a lot of the buildings that are up now, uh, especially along Hall of Fame, uh, were not there. There was a lot more, uh, there were some Quonset huts still up. There were some apartment places uh, along there. There were um, um, where the Noble Center was, that used to be a parking lot, and where the uh, uh, International Trade Center is, used to be a parking lot. And I think that there were probably a lot more trees, although they've planted some since then, but um, it didn't stretch nearly as much as it does now. So they put out a lot of buildings since then. What was your impression of the campus when you came? I thought it was pretty. I thought that uh, it was nice that the architecture is all pretty much the same style, the Georgian style. I didn't think the campus was as pretty as Iowa State, which is the one that I had been at uh, when I was working at the library there. And um, 
I didn't think it was quite as varied as the University of Iowa, but I I did like it. It's a lot flatter than either of those uh, campuses are, which I kind of like because I don't like to climb up and down hills. Okay. Yeah. What was the town of Stillwater like? Uh, it was pretty much like Ames and Iowa City in many ways. Uh, so I felt pretty comfortable here from the very beginning. Uh, I think Oklahoma itself, except that it's hotter in the summertime and they, the winters are not as severe, has a lot in common with Iowa because it's kind of rural. Um, people are very friendly. Uh, you know, people will help you out quite a bit the way they do in Iowa. And uh, just the, some of the countryside, except that the fact that dirt is red instead of black, some of the countryside really reminded me of Iowa a lot. Okay. Uh, what adjustments did you need to make for an Iowan to be on a campus populated with Okies? Get them used to the accents. <laughs> I couldn't always understand if there was a particularly strong Oklahoma accent. Uh, I sometimes had trouble figuring out just exactly what it was that they were trying to tell me or what they were asking for. Um, that was one of the adjustments. I think that one of the things that startled me a lot in the beginning and still kind of is different than Iowa is the fact that um, well, one of my friends had been out on a date and uh, she asked her date for some Kleenex and he said, look in the glove compartment, she pulled it up and there was a gun. And you see a lot more guns in Oklahoma or know of people who have them than you do in Iowa. That was something that startled me and it still is something that I've never quite gotten used to. Not that Oklahomans go around shooting them off all the time, but it was just that there's a lot more casual attitude toward guns down here than there is up in Iowa. Uh, can you describe what the uh, uh, cataloging department was like when you first started? It was about the same number of catalogers, but everything was done by hand, not on computer. The only computers that were in the department were, I think, two, maybe three OCLC computers, and they were the big beehive computers that uh, had an attached keyboard. Uh, they did not do anything else except uh, bring up OCLC records. All of the cards were typed, uh, anything that went into the card catalog. Uh, we could order sets of cards from OCLC, but any authority cards, any um, other kinds of cards that we needed to have uh, for uh, our card catalog and our authority catalog it had to be typed by hand. And when I, the very first time when I got here, I think that with, there were some things that we weren't getting from OCLC and we had to mimeograph them. Not mimeograph, but, but Xerox them. And uh, then, of course, everything, the cards were all filed in the card catalog. And each of us had a section. And we would take, uh, usually, depending on how many books had been done the week before or how many cards we got in, it could take anywhere from a couple hours to two or three days. Uh, also, um, the assistants didn't do what they do now. The assistants mostly did typing. Uh, they did uh, some checking of the records, but they did not do ca copy cataloging the way the assistants do now. They were, uh, the copy, what we call copy cataloging that the assistants do is the main job of the catalogers. And we didn't do as much original cataloging as we do now. So. Uh, what was the library like? Uh, you know, when I say that, I kind of remember it where we had the different floors. Yeah. Because could you kind of describe that when you first came, when, uh, as how the library was set up? Uh, each floor, of course, was a different topic. Uh, I think in the basement there was uh, physical sciences. On the main <coughs> floor there were uh, agricultural sciences. Uh, second floor was uh, ready reference in the catalog and acquisitions departments. Uh, third floor was humanities, fourth floor was social sciences, and then do government documents has always been on the fifth. Each floor 
had an office for the librarians and there was a what's called main entry catalog or subject catalogs on each floor as well so that people didn't have to go down to the main card catalog on second floor to look things up. Um, but there was always somebody at each of the reference desks and there was a, a reference area, a ready, ready reference and a reference desk on the second floor but each topic, each subject area had its own reference desk and uh, staff. So that was quite a bit different. It's actually changed a few times because at one point they moved everything to second floor and then they broke it up again and then they now they have the present system where again it's all on one floor except for different documents which has its own reference. Where was the Dean's office at? The Dean's office was in um, a little area uh, just off the uh, catalog, where the catalog department is now. It's what is now Special Collections. Uh, the Dean's office was the big office that's back there uh, where the uh, uh, head of Special Collections has her office. And then the other rooms were uh, secondary offices for Mr. Nelson. Uh, they did not have the uh, section that they have now that's been built out um, even before the new part was put in, the glass in part, they had uh, they had taken um, well, no, they had another room. They had a conference room, and that's where they had the faculty meetings and so on. Uh, and then they also put out a uh, after they moved the dean's office and special collections moved in, they took over part just by putting up shelves, and then later on they put in walls. Okay. But it was rather small, and the main entrance was often through the catalog department. A lot of people came through the catalog department. How many Dean of Libraries have you worked under? Three. Okay. Can you name them for us? Roscoe Rouse was the first one when I came. And then uh, Dean Ed Johnson and now Dean Sheila Johnson. Okay. Um, can you name some of the other department heads that you have known? Oh, let's see. Well, of course, uh, Coming. <laughs> uh, there was a department head down in physical sciences, Calvin Brewer, who reminded me a bit of my dad. He was kind of a, a tall uh, person who liked to joke and was kind of soft-spoken. And uh, I think he later on had Parkinson's disease. Uh, in, I can't remember who was head of the agricultural sciences at the time. But I know up in uh, Humanities, it was Terry Bassford, okay. who was an Anglophile from way back. <laughs> he loved the Queen, he loved England, he loved all that stuff. Um, social Sciences was um, Ed Holman, who was, I really liked Ed a lot, but he had a temper. <laughs> and uh, sometimes he would come down steaming mad because he couldn't find something, but as soon as she found it for him, he was all sweet and kind and very appreciative. Um, and of course, uh, Vicki Phillips used to be a head of documents, who's now down in sciences, but so I, but I can't remember who it was that was in the agricultural sciences. I'm just drawing a blank. Oh, what about vet med and, ar and architecture? Oh, vet med. Um, the one I remember the best is, of course, Laverne Jones. Uh, she used to be in uh, the Ag Sciences, and then they, when they actually built the library over there, uh, she moved over there and was the main librarian there for several times. And um, architecture, I, we've, had, we've had several different architecture ones. We had Teresa Failing. Okay. Uh, there was people before her, but I can't. That she's the one that was most memorable. And then um, Bill Harriff, who was a friend of my roommates, good friend of my roommates. And um, did you mention Gila? Gila was head of acquisitions. Yeah. Oh yeah. Gila and I are very good friends even to this day. And uh, she could be rather intimidating, but she was also a lot of fun. We were both Star Trek fanatics, so we would go to all the Star Trek uh, conventions and have a good time there. Um, has the library building changed a lot since you arrived as far as, uh, was the new part already added on? Yeah, the new part was already added on. Um, 
and it hasn't changed all that much except that they've built in the new areas like for special collections and um, uh, the oral history project. Uh, they've changed departments from place to place occasionally and they've opened up, um, taken out some offices and put in others. The main thing of course um, has been the use of computers. This has made a lot of difference in the way things are arranged and in the furniture that they have bought because they had to buy a lot of new furniture, uh, cubicle panels, all this stuff and just going from one computer in the department to maybe three com computers from for L OCLC, and uh, and now everybody has a computer. And even when we first started out, the computers were fairly primitive. You really couldn't do word much word processing on them anymore or anything like that. And now we can sit there, and if we have a question about a book we're cataloging, we can get on the web and find out information about the topic. We can check for different people to find out what their, their uh, names are. We can do all kinds of things that we couldn't do before. And we've been able, the catalogers at least, have been able to count, concentrate more on what would, are really more professional parts of cataloging and leaving the copy cataloging. And what we used to do as professionals are now being done by the assistants. Um, can you tell, talk a little bit about how the staff and the librarians have changed and how they dress at work? I, it was a lot more formal when I first got here. Um, a pantsuits were allowed <laughs> because we'd gotten over that thing. But I think that um, the assistants usually tried to dress uh, casual but not too casual. And certainly the librarians all were professionally dressed. Uh, it has gotten a lot more casual over the <coughs> over the years. I think that the librarians who work with the public still dress professionally. Uh, it might be a little more casual than it was, but it certainly is more professional. Whereas um, the I think even the assistants, the full time assistants, it may be casual, but it is good casual. Uh, student assistants just kind of work or whatever they want. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, tell us how the library's Read 'em Cowboy slogan came about. Well, <laughs> we had decided to make uh, a logo to go with the, um, the library and to put on buttons and to put on stationery or whatever. And they had taken the universal sign for the reader, which was just a uh, kind of a body holding up a book with a round head on it, and put a cowboy hat on it. <coughs> and we were trying to come up with a saying, a cute saying that would go on there. And they thought of several things, and then Sheila asked me if I could think of anything. And I was just getting ready for work the next day, and Read him Cowboy popped into my head. <laughs> Now, you're famous in the library department for two quotes. Oh, oh yes. And could you explain uh, the cataloger's motto, which is... Okay, the cataloger's motto is, in Latin, Ispendeo. Uh, when we are cataloging things, many times, uh, especially since I get asked a lot of questions, there are certain kinds of things that one day you might catalog them this way because of certain conditions in the, the record, uh, conferences especially. And another day you might catalog it totally different. And so when somebody asks me a question, does this do it, do we always do it this way? And I will say it depends, is spendeo. Uh, the other one is uh, coming out of our Bibco meetings. And for those that don't know the BIPCO meetings, uh, this is a program by which we have been trained to do Library of Congress level cataloging. And we get together to check each other's work and to uh, actually learn how to do it better. And we have discovered that the more lightweight or the smaller something, as the fewest pages that it has, <coughs> the small, the, the, most insignificant pieces are the most trouble to catalog. So it's <coughs> the size of the piece is inversely proportional to the amount of trouble it will take to catalog it. Okay. 
That's your theory of cataloging. <coughs> That's my theory of cataloging. Okay. Um, well, you've been in the department for a, quite a while now, so can you name some of the librarians that you have worked with in the department that are some that are now and, and those that are previously? Yeah, right now. Well, of course, Koming has been my mentor and has really taught me almost everything I know because you pick things up in the library school, of course, but it's all theory and it's not until you actually get into the job that you really start to learn. Um, uh, one of the librarians that I remember, she was not a cataloger, but she made a huge impression on me. I don't think she meant to do it this way. Uh, Beth Struppel from Physical Sciences. I had been here less than a week, and my desk at that time was the first one you got to when you entered the department. And she came in with three enormous volumes, slammed them on my desk, and said, what is the meaning of this? I just kind of sat there trembling. <laughs> we finally figured out it was a serial, so I sent her over to Mrs. Carroll, who was the serials librarian at the time. And by then, Elizabeth had gotten over being mad, and she was just the sweetest pie in the meantime I was sitting there like this. <laughs> and of course, um, uh, other catalogers that uh, I've really gotten to know, one of course is Rup Sandu, who was here when I got here. and. Um, she was fascinating. Uh, she would tell us stories sometimes of her childhood or the way things that were done in India. And she always wore the most beautiful clothes, saris and uh, the uh, trousers and tunics that they wear, always with a beautiful scarf, always with matching shoes. <laughs> it was wonderful. <clears throat> and uh, uh, there just have been so many of the present ones that we have. Uh, I've really gotten to be good friends with, and I've kind of gotten into the position of mentor, which is both fun and not so fun. Well, there was Barbara Griever. Yeah, Barbara Griever. Uh, she was from Idaho, and has actually gone back to Idaho, <coughs> and she was kind of a character. Um, Deborah Otson, who was married to an Episcopal minister, <coughs> who always... Um, used to come around, she would pick up the mail and she'd go around and distribute it and she'd always imitate the siren from the Adams family. Whoop, whoop, mail's in! <laughs> she was a real character. Uh, and uh, I don't know if, it was Barbara Griever that always used to say, if I had a brain I'd be dangerous. Okay, there was uh, Lisa Bodenheimer. <coughs> Lisa Bodenheimer. Uh, very smart, but kind of nervous. She was so meticulous and so concerned with getting things right that sometimes she would get herself into a headache. She's gotten over that. She's not at Clemson University and she's head of the catalog department. But uh, we used to go to Star Trek conventions with her as well. Uh, uh, Steve Folsom? Steve Folsom is the god of cataloging. <laughs> Steve was one of these who took to cataloging right away, who was very smart, who uh, I think was born knowing the rules, but it wasn't just the rules, it was just being able to figure out how to, to do things, how to take something, the kind of, we get an item in that we'd never seen but the type, same type before, or we didn't know how to even begin, he would figure out some way to do it. He was the one that we would go to if we had questions, especially about subjects, because he could always figure it out. And he is now at the Library of Congress. So. And Michael Kim? <coughs> Michael, um, I don't know if Michael really wanted to be a cataloger. He wanted to be a librarian very much. But I think what he wanted to be is what he is now, which is a head of catalog. <laughs> I think he wanted to be an administration from the very beginning. But he was always very nice. He was always very concerned for people. Uh, I remember once that somebody had had a, a bone density test and he they mentioned it to him, and he wanted to know all about it, what it was, what it was for, and so on. And I thought he went around to every female librarian and staff in the department, urging them to have a bone density test. <coughs> uh, Barbara Carroll. Barbara Carroll uh, was here when I got here. She was a serials librarian. 
a very quiet, very, very refined and ladylike and somewhat passive aggressive. Uh, she actually, uh, we got to be good friends with her. My uh, best friend, uh, Debbie Shaw, who was an uh, acquisitions librarian under Gala Houston, uh, we decided to uh, get a house together. And Barbara was moving to Pueblo, Colorado. And uh, she said that she would rent it to us for a little more than her mortgage payment. And so we got a three-bedroom, two-bathroom house for about $450 a month and a double car garage. <clears throat> but she uh, moved to Pueblo. She had about, I think at the time we moved her out, she had six cats. So we took two cars, and one of them had three cats in it, and the other one had three cats in it. <laughs> we drove all the way to Pueblo, Colorado. Okay, and what about Linda Taylor? Uh, Linda is one of the nicest people I know. Uh, she unfortunately is uh, on a disabled list at the moment, although I, we're hoping she can get back pretty soon. Uh, she is very quiet and um, nothing disturbs her much. And she knows a lot about cereals. She is ex excellent with cereals. And we really are hoping she'll come back very soon. Of course, I won't because I won't be here, but... <laughs> <clears throat> well, when you came into the library, uh, of course we had a card catalog back mm -hmm. then. Can you describe what you did when they talked about shifting the drawers? Uh, one of the things that uh, we were to keep track of as we filed cards was to see that if there was a drawer that was too tight, if it was uh, there were too many cards in there, then people who were trying to find something would have to pry them apart in order to read anything that was on the cards. So we kept track of those. We'd report any. Um, there were certain areas, of course, the A's and the S's that would come to mind, where there was always uh, there were always a lot of tight drawers. Uh, we would kind of uh, sit up t together, measure several of the drawers around the drawers that we wanted to shift, and figure out where we could uh, take some out and where we could put some in. And then we would start, usually at the beginning, um, shift some cards into a, an em, into your drawer. Uh, then we would write down what we had changed because each drawer had a label. Then we would go ahead and maybe if the next drawer would be too tight, we might shift cards forward into that drawer and some of the other ones card other cards back into the previous drawer. If there were several that were very tight, we'd line them all up on the table and then just work, being very careful to keep them in order, but just work until everything had at least a maybe three or four inch space at the back. If we could get more than that it was better. But that way then people could look at the cards without having to pry them apart. And some of the changes that we had to make uh, could be quite extensive. I remember once we changed out three or four cabinets at, the, at just one time. Uh, <clears throat> what kind of materials have you cataloged? Just about everything. Um, well, what? I, go ahead. I like to catalog the stuff with pretty pictures, <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, we, uh, I don't do too many of the international documents like the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization or uh, some of those. Uh, those are usually going to be some kind of agricultural science. Uh, I've done art, I've done mathematics, I've done physics, I've done astronomy, I've done uh, veterinary medicine, architecture. Well, we just do, we do just about everything. About the only thing that I have not cataloged is cereals. But I also do, uh, have done um, a lot of the audiovisual uh, videotapes, video cassettes. Uh, uh, I, it's fascinating to have watched that change because when I first started out, <clears throat> we did some video cassettes, not a whole lot. We did film strips, and we did slides, and we did a lot of posters. And uh, for a while there, people would would have calendars that would have uh, maybe famous artworks or uh, historical dates, and we would catalog those. 
when we started cataloging for uh, CML especially is when we started getting a lot of audiovisual things because before that they were done down in the microphone media room and we didn't really do much with them. Uh, and now the film strips have totally disappeared. Uh, LPs, uh, long playing records for those that don't know what it was, and there are some that will not, will not know what it is. Uh, the vinyl records I uh, almost never see anymore. It's almost all DVDs, CDs, and uh, a few videotapes, and uh, whatever new stuff comes out. Um, I had to tell this story. I'm not going to say who it was. Uh, somebody cataloged something they'd gotten from Special Collections, and they brought it over to me to check as they had to do an original. And it was a disc about, oh, maybe three inches in diameter. And it had a hole in the middle. And it was about, oh, maybe not even half an inch thick. And it had shiny plastic around the edge of the disc. And they had cataloged it as some kind of electronic resource, but they had a very, a very short record because it was impossible to tell what it was because we didn't have the machinery. And I looked at it and I said, "This is an eight millimeter film." I said, "Film? What do you mean film?" I said, "You know, you go to the movies, they show the film. See these little sprockets edges along here? That's not a film." I said, "Yeah, it's a film. Films are this wide. Films are, you know, this, you know." I said, this is an 8 millimeter film. This is what my dad used to film us when we were jumping around in the swimming pool. And she had no idea what it was. Okay. Times have changed. Yes, sure <laughs> um, You've trained <coughs> all the librarians and most of the staff that has come through the department, correct? Uh, for the last few years, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Who trained you? Coming. Coming did most of it. And uh, I had uh, a little help from uh, a librarian who was here named Mary Brown. But mostly it was Coming. She uh, had a lot of patience, especially since there were some things that I really didn't have a clue about because I had not been able to take advanced cataloging. I just had basic cataloging. But she got me through, and she always was praising me even when I was convinced that I was going to be fired because I obviously didn't know anything. <laughs> but yeah, it was mostly coming. I would say almost entirely coming. Okay. Do you know how long that process took? Oh, it was a couple of years before I really felt like I knew something. The first six months were terrible. I really thought I was going to be fired at any minute because I was so stupid. But then after that, we had a talk and, and she said, Oh no, you're doing very well. And then I felt better. <laughs> I still think there are a lot of things that I don't know that she does. And that I think that there are some of the other catalogers like you who probably know more things or, or, or are more particular, who are more interested or precise than I am. I'm more a kind of a, a general, uh, let's figure what it's all about and get something in there. Whereas I think that you and Michelle and Coming really want it to be as thorough as possible. And so I think actually, and I'm rather proud because I did train you and Michelle, that uh, you have turned out to be the catalogers that you are. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, where do you find the patients? You've trained so many people and really that's one of your real um, characterized when you're trained is that you have so much patience. I think it comes from living with Twelve younger brothers and sisters. That's where it started out. I didn't have a lot of patience when I was growing up, but you had to learn patience as we got older, especially because we weren't allowed to smack them anymore. And I think it came, um, I spent two years teaching elementary art. And there again, I had to learn more patience there. And I think another thing is that there were a lot of people who were patient with me who made me feel that, oh, I made a mistake, big deal, I'll fix it next time, I'll do better next time. They taught me how to do that. And that's what I try to keep in mind, that these people are not trying to make stupid mistakes. These people want to learn. They don't want to do a bad job. They want to be able to 
be proud of what they've done. And I think that's why I have to keep the patience because I want them to feel that, yes, I've done something wrong, but no, it's not the end of the world. Uh, what changes do you think has impacted the department the most? Um, automation, cataloging rules, I mean, what do you think has really changed the department since you've been there? Having computers at every desk. Absolutely. Uh, before that, whenever we wanted to do something on OCLC, we would get up, go over to the OCLC terminals, and on the way we might talk to somebody or ask questions or so on. And we did a lot of moving around. Also, if we wanted to check any subject authorities, name authorities, we had to go to the file and look it up there. We got up and moved around. We had to get something that from the fifth floor or the fourth floor or the basement or something. We moved up, we got up and moved around. Now I would say 95% of the time we're at the desk and we are looking at the computer. I think we still interact quite a bit, but not nearly as much as we did and we don't move around a lot. And even I want to talk to you, you're on the other side of the room, and if I'm in a hurry about something, I don't get up and go over there, I send you an email. So I think the major thing is just having, not so much automation, as just having a computer on every desk. Okay. Why do you think people perceive that catalogers are weird? Catalogers are weird. Uh, we're very picky. Uh, we do kind of stay back in the back <laughs> and not talk to people. Uh, I think it's mostly because we are concerned with fine points of things. And uh, I think it sometimes it's to the point where it, doesn't, it really doesn't need to be that fine. But we're trying to create something that will be a formats and uh, conventions that will be instantly recognizable to somebody who's reading a uh, an English record and he's French, let's say. He'll know that this is the title, he'll know that this is the author, and he'll know all this stuff. And by having standards, it's like um, when you're trying to put something together and your screws are standard and you're able to go and get your uh, screwdriver and put it together because you know that your screwdriver will work on those screws. Whereas if everybody does their own thing, you're never going to be able to put anything together because you will never have the tools. But I think that's why we're weird, is because we're very tool oriented. How many assistants have you had? Oh, I average about I average about one a year, and this is in spite of the fact that I've had several that have been with me for two, up from anywhere from two to four years. Okay. A lot of my assistants um, are quite young, and the last thing they want to do <laughs> is take care. I have taken over a few assistants from somebody else, maybe another cataloger who left or who wasn't getting along with somebody. Uh, and then I've had some that, uh, there was one that was shaping up to be very good and all of a sudden her boyfriend got drafted by the Toronto Blue Jays. So off she went. And uh, I only had one that I fired. And uh, she had been here for only three weeks, but that was the only one. Every, everybody else, some of them, were very, very good, and some of them were tolerable, where I knew that there were certain things that they were never going to do right, but they did enough right that I could, I could deal with that. But I figured it out, and it's been at least 25, anywhere from 25 to 28. Assistants. Assistants. Wow. <clears throat> okay, can you tell us some of the weird stuff you've cataloged? Ooh. Did you do a rock? I didn't do a rock, but I did some maracas. I did some flutes. I did some, uh, oh, it's hard to think of it now because it, it's just whatever they bring into me. Uh, if you have a natural object, and we've had some natural objects that have come in, I think once we had, I had a bunch of bugs that were in a kit that uh, somebody had made up for CML. And uh, uh, I didn't catalog this, but I, I found a, the record for it where it was a book on uh, the Jewish Passover, the Seder. 
and included in there was a Seder cracker. And it said, uh, the, the note was, include Seder cracker, and there was a note down below that says, Seder cracker consumed by catalogers. <laughs> I haven't had anything quite that weird, but I have had musical instruments, and I've had dolls, and I've had uh, the occasional, I guess, not rocks so much, but bugs. And uh, sometimes uh, they'll have programs over at CML where the little kids will make books, and sometimes we'll catalog those. So, okay. Yeah. Um, what was the worst LC cataloging record that you've ever seen? It seems there's there's a story about that. There is a story about that. I got one once. The book was on avian botulism. It was about how Canada geese, uh, when hunters go hunting with lead shot, and they miss, of course, it falls down to the bottom of the pond. The geese and the ducks will go down there, and as they're foraging, they pick up these lead shot, the sled shot, and it will poison them. And so uh, the book was on, the, the subject heading was avian botulism. The call number that LC assigned to it was 619.2, which is cattle. And the subject heading, avian botulism, was tagged 60010, which is a person. So it's Mr. Botulism, comma, avian. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. And I've had, I've seen other ones that have been almost as bad, but that was the one that took the prize. So. Uh, what's your favorite subject to catalog? Is it literature? Is it uh, agriculture? Is it children's materials? <clears throat> you have it. Is it gardening I books? I think Cookery? it is actually science. Some of the science books that I get, particularly, uh, um, one of the ones that I was cataloging that I actually read was on uh, the person who discovered this, the uh, coelacanth, that prehistoric fish that was found around Mad not Madagascar, Cameroon, that has been thought to have been extinct for millions of years. And there's uh, another one that was a biography of uh, Jean Shoemaker, who uh, was an astronomer who saw the the one that crashed in the the comet that crashed into Jupiter, and there have been uh, biographies. I have, one of the, my favorite biographies was Mary Shelley, and uh, I think I think biography and some of the sciences, if it's not too dull, sciences, literature is fun too. But I had to be careful that I don't read them at this stage. <laughs> Um, are you going to miss writing and updating all those procedure manuals that you have uh, developed for the department? Well, in a way, I won't. In another way, that was one of the most fun things that I did. I enjoy writing things like that because I like to make things clear and I like to, to put in the examples, pictures for the examples, so that somebody can look at it and say, yes, I know how to use that. And actually, I think since we got the monologue, cataloging manual done. That's been a lot easier to train people because the examples are there and they can look at it and they don't need to, to ask questions because some of them are really shy about asking questions. And I've noticed a really a lot of improvement in the way that they have been learning. So I feel pretty proud of that. Okay. What do you think is your legacy to the OSU library and to the cataloging department? I think it partly will be the manuals, the fact that I've tried to do manuals and make them clear. And, um, oh, I don't know, my brilliant personality and the, uh, the mottos. <laughs> do you have any poems you could recite to us? <clears throat> oh, let me see. Any cataloging poems? I can't think of anything offhand. Um, that I can recite without making a lot of mistakes. <laughs> but I do. I did like to do, uh, if I was going to have some kind of a little get-together and explain something, I would like to do it. And then a fake advertisement and, and, uh, uh, or write a poem about it. And, uh, it was just fun to do. Something that, to kind of add a little 
access to something that's Keep really, away. really dull. <laughs> yeah, I think that, oh, the Weird Cutter slideshow. Yes. The Weird Cutter slideshow is my favorite. Yeah, that, that's really. Uh, because I would put little digs in there, like uh, uh, putting Paul Newman up as an example of, of uh, the long, hot summer. And, <laughs> and uh, putting Dante as... Uh, uh, Dante's Inferno as the place where all catalogers go, <laughs> things like that. That was a lot of fun. I really liked to do that. If you were to give advice to any future or current students out there that were considering library school, what would that be? Don't count on it being static. What you learn in library school will get you started, but you have to be able to get into new rules, new ways of doing things, new things that are going to come through to be cataloged, new formats. And now over my 30 years, it was only within the last half, maybe even the last third, that it really started to change, and then it's been changing constantly. And I think that's what's going to happen. So if they go to library school and they learn something, they should not be surprised if a lot of that becomes obsolescent fairly quickly and they just have to be able to go with whatever is coming up. So that would be it. Uh, where does the phrase you betcha come from? Oh you betcha, yeah, that's from when I, I you know, when you come up to uh, northern Iowa, not so much in my area, but uh, you know it's right there on the Minnesota border and not that far from North Dakota. And uh, you betcha is we don't use it so much anymore, and we don't use, use oof the meg anymore so much because the second generation Norwegians don't really use that as much as we used to. So. Well, but, we're about ready to come to a close. Is there anything that you would like to add to say anything uh, about your 30 years here at the library that we haven't touched upon? Uh, Actually, I'm just going to really miss all the people. Um, I enjoyed a lot of the aspects of the job. Uh, I think I really like to do original cataloging. I really like to do the manuals. It was, uh, it's a, a very real form of creativity, I think, the, the original cataloging and all of the, the manuals and things like that. But uh, what I'm really going to miss is all my friends. Yeah. So. Well, on behalf of the OSU Library and the cataloging department and a fellow cataloger, I want to thank you for all you've given to the library and to all of us in the department. You've just been a wonderful resource person and mm -hmm. a great friend and a great <laughs> mimic, and we truly will miss you. Thank you very much, and thank I'll you. be back. <laughs>